so I'm going to be walking around a little bit. Um, thank you for the introduction. Just very briefly, um, I am Gabe. I know that there are two Gabes in YBC, so I just wanted to <laughs> kind of clarify that I am the Gabe that became a zookeeper that is prolific on social media. And if that is confusing, because there are two Gabes from YBC, that are prolific on social media. Zookeepers. <laughs> I was going to let you know that when we were in YBC, they did differentiate the two of us by calling us Big Game and Little Game. And if that's confusing to you because neither of us are particularly large people, um, there's one final way that we did have you guys tell us apart, and that was by calling one of us Canadian Game. And if that's confusing because one of us is Gabe A, and the other is 50% Canadian, then we might be the same person. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. I have a presentation that I want to give kind of about my time in YBC and my career. I also briefly wanted to talk about what I could offer as advice to you guys moving forward throughout your career. So this presentation is kind of divided into two parts. We're going to start a little bit with my career. So, my history. So, pre-career, this handsome fella up here. Uh, a lot of what inspired me to start getting involved in wildlife and conservation stemmed from before even YBC. I spent a lot of time outside in nature, traveling. The Indiana Dunes State Park was a big place that I spent a lot of time with my family. I'm sure that many of you guys have been there before. It's beautiful. Uh, but most important to mention in my career, career career for that matter, is probably something similar with a lot of you, which is that it's kind of a mix of two worlds coming together. I spent a lot of time outside, but by no means was I roughing out in the wilderness. I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, so I did spend quite a lot of time watching TV, playing video games on the computer, um, as I'm sure many of you guys have as well. So, being in this career, it seems like a lot of the applicable things that I learned happened from my time out in the wilderness, out in nature, but that's not actually true. Uh, my career has been kind of a blend of those two worlds, of the technology and the more urban living, as well as the natural world. So, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So, this picture is from when I was in YBC, and most of you that know me from YBC will know this is not one of my long hair pictures. So, I have erased pretty much all those from existence. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry about that. But this is probably one of my last years in YBC. I did the program from 2008 to 2011. Some of the things that I learned, I think a lot of you will agree having been in the program, is that I was a kid that spent a lot of time outside and on a computer. So social skills weren't really my strongest suit at that point in time. But the great thing about YBC is that you learn how to talk to people. You learn about interpretation and public speaking to the point where I actually consider it a great strength of mine now in my career. So that's something that I definitely attribute to the program itself. Um, Additionally, I learned about working in a mission-oriented organization, some place that you're really proud to say that you worked at, and what that means moving forward as far as what I chose for my job. And then finally, that connections are made on the front line. To be honest, it's kind of crazy to me that probably a majority of the guests that came to Brookfield Zoo were talking to high schoolers more than anyone else, and I think that says a lot about the importance of our jobs, um, interpreting on the front lines like that. And it's something that has carried with me, remembering throughout my career that connections are made in person, they're made on the front line, no matter where you go in your career and how far up the ladder you climb, those connections are super important. So after I did YBC, I made a clean transition into the education department here at Brookfield Zoo. Uh, I started off at the Hamill Family Play Zoo, where I worked with children on a lot of projects, crafts, things like that. Nature play is a really big part of that job. Um, so ready curriculum, doing things like that. And then I transitioned into Zoo Camp. Zoo Camp was a really interesting time for me because right when I started was the time that the former lead of Zoo Camp basically left and took everything with her. So we didn't really have any kind of curriculum, anything to really go off of as far as what we should do as a counselor. And so they kind of threw us out there and said, good luck. And while that might be a negative thing for some people, I find that throughout my career, these opportunities have really helped me thrive. Uh, there are opportunities for you to try new things, to try your hand at leadership. And for me, it was an opportunity that I learned a lot about how to work with children, how to write curriculum, and what evidence-based practices meant. So definitely this time in my career really solidified the fact that no matter where I wanted to go, I knew I wanted to work with people, not just animals, but people too. 
Um, my time at the University of Illinois was interesting. A lot of people have asked me, especially being a zookeeper, what my major was. And a lot of people are surprised to know that I majored in psychology. Um, one of the reasons why is when I applied to the University of Illinois, I originally started off with a degree in biology. That's pretty typical for people looking to work with animals. And I learned very, very, very quickly that U of I, if you have a biology degree, most of the time you're working in a lab on human medicine. Um, wasn't really my boat. I know a lot of people that did graduate and continue to work in conservation with a biology degree, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. So I kind of felt things out. And I realized that I was kind of living in between those two worlds of education and animal care. And psychology was one of those degrees that I could get a job in either. So that worked out really well for me. And of all the classes I took, animal studies, biology, evolution, psychology, psychology classes are probably the most relevant to the work that I do now and where I've taken the most away. So um, that is probably one of the reasons that I became a really good animal trainer and that I became a really good educator of young children. So now we're moving into my time in the animal care department. Um, I did three seasons at Wild Encounters and at Animal Family Play Zoo. And this was the first opportunity where I made that transition from working with uh, people to working with animals. And luckily, because it was at Animal Family Play Zoo and at Wild Encounters, I still got to do a lot of interpretation, which was very important to me. Kind of best of both worlds. Um, so I did that from 2014 to 2016, and I fell in love with animal training. It definitely kind of took over my interest. And you have to remember that at the latter part of these seasons, I was also in college studying psychology. So it was a good mix of learning academic principles as well as real life application of how to work with these animals. So the other benefit is that I got to work with a wide range of animals. So the cool thing about working in the ambassador department is you don't get to work with just one kind of animal. You get to work with many, many different kinds. So. Turkey vulture, goats, emus, prehensile porcupines, all sorts of animals. Again, a thing where at first it can seem very overwhelming to work with something so big or such a wide range of animals, but given the opportunity for growth as an individual, that made me into who I am today. So going forward, uh, Cosmo Zoo was the last zoo that I was at. Uh, and as it was mentioned, I actually just accepted a new job at Minor Park Zoo. Um, I haven't even started there yet, so if I kind of jump between past and present tense of my time at Cosby Zoo, I apologize for that. Um, so it's just a little bit of a transitional period. But Cosby Zoo is really amazing. If you have not been there before, I highly recommend you go. It's located in Wheaton, Illinois, and one of the big differences between Brookfield and Cosby is that Cosby's a lot smaller. So it's still an ACA accredited zoo. It still has to meet all the same standards as a big zoo like Brookfield, but on a much smaller scale. So with that comes a lot of responsibility. So really briefly, I compiled a small list of things <laughs> that I did as part of my responsibilities there as a keeper. Um, lots and lots of things to do, which again, this list is extremely overwhelming. I don't expect anyone to read all of it. Um, but you'll see that, again, this is a job that was very overwhelming on the surface. There's a lot of responsibility a lot of things that are kind of up in the air, but this really, for me, honed my focus on what made me different and what I really enjoy about working there. And when you are put into a position and a job, you're gonna find your niche. Everyone does. And especially in a job where you have a lot of different responsibilities and you do a lot of things, you'll find things that you really enjoy doing and help others grow in that area too. And that's one of my favorite part about working at Cosley. So I'm going to talk briefly about three things that I really enjoyed working there more specifically. And one of the reasons that I thought it was a cool opportunity, just again, kind of talking about the latest things that I've done in my career that again, going back to YBC, have definitely helped bring me to this place. So the first is that I worked with two of our four American guinea hogs, this handsome boy over on the right, his name is Tank. And he is the best guinea hog there is. Don't listen to anyone else at Cosmic that tells you otherwise, because they will disagree. Just remember, he is the best thing. Um, so the cool thing, like I said, is having the amount of responsibility we did to make real change, real impact in our job. So when I started working with these hogs, they were, um, we were taking their weight weekly on a scale. We were giving them all their injections, like you do with every animal, making sure that their health records were up to date. But these things weren't voluntary, which means basically we were kind of baiting them on with food. Um, we were just poking them really quickly, trying to mitigate how stressful it was. So when I started there, I was approached by a, a trainer who asked me if I would be interested in training. And I said, yes, um, I am kind of a glutton for working with 
really difficult animals. So a lot of the stories that I have are either great successes or horrifying nightmares. It goes both ways. Um, but this is a success story, and we ended up working with them to get them to voluntarily step up onto a scale and to voluntarily take injections for reinforcement, which we use orange juice for, which a lot, we have a lot of questions about that. We use orange juice. Um, and again, part of being in a position like that is having the opportunities to do things and to thrive is that recently we just submitted um, a paper to the AZAC magazine for publication about our training there. So again, just having the opportunity to make a bigger impact has really helped me thrive in my career. Um, I feel like everyone's different. Some people kind of like low-key jobs, they don't have to do much, and then they go back. I'm the opposite. I really enjoy working in a place where I can put everything into it. And this place, Kazu Zoo, has definitely helped me do that. So the next thing is that everyone at Cosway has a point area, or a keeper at Cosway has a point area. My point area was the Raptor buildings. Um, we have an American Castro and a barn owl on the left and right. Um, part of my responsibilities were making sure that I was kind of a squeaky wheel for the area or an advocate for that area to make sure they got all their needs met. So when I started, um, they hadn't had a point area in a while, so a lot of their perching was a little worse for wear. So I spent the good part of my first few months hauling huge branches into those exhibits, um, hauling huge branches out of those exhibits, which is much more time intensive than it sounds like, um, and really revamping what they had going on there. And this was where I really kind of fell in love with animal welfare and kind of really pushing to make sure that our standards are the best that they can be in the field. Um, Coping, for those of you who don't know, is the process of trimming a raptor's beak um, to make sure that it is honed and it, is, so it doesn't get overgrown. That was another area where I felt, as point person, there was a little bit of confusion between staff, so I ended up writing up a really long guideline on why we cope, how we cope, and what tools we use to do so. All right, so that's the first part of my presentation. I really wanted to give you guys an idea of who I am, what my background is, and the second part of my presentation I wanted to dive a little bit more into what I think it means to make an impact in my field, so conservation work, wildlife work, and then your field, whatever that decides to be. I know that not everyone in this room is going to work with wildlife, or will work with wildlife, or currently works with wildlife, but this is going to be applicable pretty much regardless of where you go, and it's just based off of some things that I have learned and hope that you guys can take away from this uh, presentation today. So the first, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we live up to our heroes. So as I mentioned, I grew up in the 90s watching TV, being very interested in wildlife. So it won't surprise you to know that Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter, was one of my biggest heroes. And I'm sure, talking to the audience I am right now, that he was probably a hero for a lot of you guys too. And the reason I bring this up at the beginning of this portion of the presentation is because a big theme that I want to talk about today is that you don't have to be an Irwin to make an impact. And I think that sometimes we get very caught up in living in the shadow of the people that we grew up idolizing. And Steve Irwin, for me, has always been that person. I've always strived to be like him. I'm pretty sure that when I was five years old and what job I wanted to have, I put Steve Irwin. <laughs> so he was definitely someone that I idolized growing up. And as I've gone into my career and learned more and more, I realized that you don't have to be this really big face like an Irwin, to make an impact. And I want to make sure that everyone here today leaves knowing that you can make a huge impact in the thing that you're passionate about, even if you're not an Irwin. So next, I wanted to talk briefly about a very quick story, probably the most important lesson that I learned in my time at U of I. It was during a creative writing lesson, um, which, again, senior year, I took a lot of strange classes that didn't have to do with my major, but that happens a lot. Um, and it's funny because this was one I've always been very interested in writing, but I was probably the only person there that wasn't a creative writing major. And I learned one of the most valuable life lessons in that classroom. And it happened one day because a lot of the students went up to the teacher and they were asking him, you know, how do I get to be a writer? How do I get to be a Tolkien? How do I get to be a Rowling? How do I get to this point in my career where I know that I met success? And they were expecting some long-winded answer um, about you know, going to school and doing internships and stuff. And he had a one-word answer, which I was just floored by. And he said, right. And at first, that sounds like the most uninspiring, obvious answer in the entire world. How do you become a writer? Right. 
But I think at the time it really resonated with me because I was at a point in my career where I felt like I could do a lot more. I felt like I could make a bigger impact than what I was doing just in my job. And so it really stuck with me that, you know, a lot of times we're waiting through this career ladder. We're waiting for us to be given a title or an opportunity to make change. And if I could have you guys take away any one thing from this presentation, I want it to be that in my career, in my time, I've learned that you do not have to wait for someone to give you a title to start making an impact on something that you're truly passionate about. So that story has stuck with me for a long time. So briefly, it was mentioned that I have a social media account. Uh, my biggest one is my YouTube following. I wanted to talk briefly about it as evidence for what I just talked about. Um, so the impact that I've made through something that is not has nothing to do with my career, has nothing to do with my professional life. This is completely on the side that I could have done with or without the title of zookeeper. Um, obviously, the experience and the things that I know have helped me grow this channel. Um, but really, again, the first part of the presentation focusing on what I've done with the career ladder. The second part is what you can do beyond that. So this is my YouTube profile. And I have a little bit of outlandish training sessions um, as some of my more recent content. But the number I want you guys to pay attention to is the 10.3 thousand subscribers. And that's not a point of bragging at all. That's a really, really small channel. And that's why I want you guys to take away from it is that 10,000 subscribers is really small. The largest person on YouTube has over 100 million subscribers. So by comparison, this is a small channel. This is something that most people would argue makes a very little impact on the world of wildlife or conservation. So I wanted to know, how do you measure impact? So when you're on YouTube, you have channel analytics, and they let you see what kind of impact you made. And what I was interested in learning was how much time impact have I had on society as a whole. So what I mean by that is that if you have someone watch a video for two minutes, as a whole, society has watched your video for two minutes. If they send it to their grandma, their grandma watches it for three minutes because she's more interested. Five minutes of total society watching your video. So I want to know as a small channel, what was my impact, both in a time sense and also how far did this go? So I measured it out, and it turns out society has spent a cumulative time of 10 years watching my videos, which is absolutely insane to me that the whole of society worldwide, over 110 countries, has spent 10 years watching videos about animal training, animal conservation, and wildlife through this tiny, tiny, tiny YouTube channel. So again, it's not a point of bragging as to how much, but it's really a point of clarifying that small channels, small people can make a huge, huge difference, um, and that you don't have to have a big name or a big title to make those, and that if you are really passionate about wildlife, if you're really passionate about conservation, or really anything that you choose to go into, you should really think about what changes can you make today, and what are you waiting for? Which leads up to, not my last slide yet, this is just further evidence that I wasn't lying. <laughs> <laughs> that I wasn't lying. Um, my last slide, which is, what is your passion, and what are you waiting for? A lot of times, we are waiting for something to happen before we start making a difference, making an impact, and while you can make a huge impact in your career professionally, given the resources and tools of a big zoo, of a big organization, I've learned that being at a smaller facility, you can really make a huge difference. And that even beyond what facility you're at, just in your personal time, if you really care about something, just putting the time and effort into anything, you can make a huge impact. So again, what is your passion and what are you waiting for? Thank you guys very much.